Let's do it. I love it. Okay, Gary Contessa, so excited to be here with you today. Um, let's see, tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me how, when you started in racing, a little bit of your accomplishments, so for those people that are not huge racing fans can know who you are. Well, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate being here, too. It's kind of nice. Um, well, I graduated from high school in 1975, and my heart was in racing. I, before that, when I was a truant uh, high school student, I'd go to Roosevelt Raceway every day and take care of horses for free and ride my bicycle there and whatnot. And um, I just, it was all about horses. My whole life was about horses, even though my family's life was not about horses, mine was. So I left the track, took, took a job with European American Bank to be a bank manager. And it's really not what I wanted to do. So. I met Dave Sazer, who had the most screwed up account. He was a horse trainer at Aqueduct, and his account was so screwed up that they sent me over there to deal with him and try and straighten out his business. And the next thing you know, I was asking him for a job, and I took a job in 1975 as a hot walker. And oh. I, I managed to go through the ranks really quickly. Um, it was like I had very little pushback on trying to become somebody in this business. And I just worked, outworked everybody, worked my way up to assistant trainer for Dave, then assistant trainer for Jimmy Pacu, Stanley Huff, Laz Barrera, and then ultimately Frank Martin. So uh, I have pretty good background as an assistant trainer, groom, hot walker. I know what it's like to be at the very bottom. And I managed to work my way to the top in New York, you know, and it, it wasn't handed to me, that's for sure. But we, as you well know, this is that kind of business where if you just work really hard, doesn't matter who you are, you can do it. And there's a lot of success stories on the racetrack of people who worked really hard and became something in racing. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, um, my name is Anna Smith, for those of people that might be watching this video that don't know me. And I actually rode for you back in, what, 2014? And now yeah, run a mortgage team myself here in Saratoga. And mortgage and, and, and um, sales are similar to that. The, if you work hard, you put in the hours, you can really rise to success. So funny story, I actually have me on one of your horses in my background here. So um, it's pretty cool to see this come full circle. So then you just recently retired, right? So what, why, why, why are you leaving us, Gary? Well, I retired from the training side of being a horse trainer. I, it's, it's a grueling 17 hour day, seven days a week. And in, it's kind of a young man's business. I had my time from like 2002 to 2010, 2011, 2012, where I'd win over 100 races a year and things were good and I had 100 horses. And like with most people in our business, as you get older, that curve, you curve down just a little bit. And it was very, I, I was getting down to 35, 40, 45 horses, and it was increasingly difficult. It's not an easy business. It was an increasingly difficult time to make ends meet with that number of horses. A lot of young trainers are really struggling. But when you're younger, when I was a younger trainer, I could groom eight or 10 horses, knock out stalls, get on horses, gallop horses, uh, get on the pony, pony horses. <laughs> I could do a lot of that myself. Me, I have had this burning desire since 2012 to be on the other side of racing, on the management side of racing, maybe on the, um, the media side of racing. I, I study racing. I love racing. And I was not loving training horses anymore. I, I love being around horses. I love buying horses for people. But as a trainer, I just felt like I hit a bit of a wall. So I decided this year, courtesy of the Department of Labor, the Department of Labor came in last year and made it very difficult to make ends meet as a horse trainer. It's not an easy business if you have 
anywhere, any less than 50 or 100 horses. You just can't make up that kind of money punching a clock. It's just that kind of business. And Kieran McLaughlin left. And I was thinking about it too. And I said, you know, this is my time. This mm -hmm. is the time for me to step away from racing. I don't have the biggest stable. I don't have the best horses. And it's time for me to, to insert myself on the management side of racing. And don't you know it, as soon as I do, I pretty much had my ducks in a row. All of a sudden, COVID-19 steps in and there is no real racing. They shut everybody down. So that stopped hiring and firing. That stopped, that stopped racetracks in their tracks. I mean, with, with the exception of three or four tracks, there is no racing. You know, right. it's basically the New York is shut down. Maryland shut down. I had some irons in the fire in Maryland. I had some irons in the fire across the country. I thought I'd be making a decision about where I wanted to be instead of being home quarantined for the, the COVID-19. So as a lot of people know in my business, um, my wife has been very sick. She has a very uh, susceptible immune system. So she is one of those ones that needs to quarantine. So I'm here helping her stay well. And it's been good. I got to clean out my basement, clean out my garage, take care of the animals, teach my son a little bit more about football and baseball and uh, coach him a little bit. So I've enjoyed this, but I could, you could see that veil from COVID-19 slowly lifting. So at some point I'm going to have to get back into the workforce, but I haven't yet. And I'm open. I'm open uh, if, if the right person wants me. Right, for sure. And um, so you're talking, we, we talked a little bit there about, um, you know, needing to have 150 to 100 horses to make it as a trainer, you know, in, in this day and time. And especially now that all this COVID stuff is happening, it was already hard enough to make it as a, as a smaller trainer. Um, how do you see this slow down and shut down of the tracks right now impacting those smaller trainers that were already you know struggling a bit there's no doubt that there are a number of trainers on life support right now i mean this is you cannot you let's just um let's talk about the cost of training a horse the cost of training a horse, now that the Department of Labor came in and you're punching time clocks and you're following a different protocol than this business used to be, is upwards around $120, $130 a day. Mm -hmm. But the industry standard is to pay a trainer about $100 a day. So what happens is most trainers, trainers make $100 a day to cover their daily expenses plus 10% or whatever their horses earn. Mm -hmm. So ho horse trainers now are not earning that 10% and they're, it's costing them more than $100 a day to train a horse. So every horse and every horse trainer, horse man, horse woman in this industry that is not racing is losing 20 to $30 a day Per horse and that's why I said you need a hundred horses because you can make that up if you're running horses every day and you're winning and you're running second and running third those percentages are gonna probably drop your net earnings to about seven percent of the horses income or six percent but it's covering your nut people right. are in desperate shape right now the trainers in New York it's amazing trainers in New York must have heard that I was going to appear on this podcast today. And I got calls from trainers in New York. Please talk about this. Please talk about that. We all have had to make huge changes to our lives in order to survive COVID-19. Everybody, everybody in the whole world has had to make changes. And I mean, the president has gone out and gotten our stimulus checks and companies are letting their a full early, furloughing workers and putting them on work, uh, on um, unemployment. But the racetrack cannot furlough workers because horses are 1,200 pound athletes who must be taken care of every day. Must Their bedding has to be changed. They have to be fed. They have to be trained. If you take a sound racehorse and you think you're going to lock him in a stall, he's going to break out of that stall and kill you. 
I mean, horses are living, breathing animals. You can't furlough a racehorse. So COVID-19 for the tracks that have been shut down is a disaster for many trainers. Mm -hmm. And the trainers in New York are reaching out to Naira. I mean, there's a couple of things they could do. I, uh, Eddie Barker gave me a great idea today. And if I was running Naira, I would have to think about it. Maybe there's a way of taking that purse cushion because we have a purse cushion in New York. Purse cushion is money that belongs to the owners and trainers, but it's there from races that didn't happen and, you know, field sizes that dropped. It, there's always a purse cushion in the range of $10, 15000000 million. Maybe they could take a half a million dollars and give every trainer a $10,000 stimulus check that, that, that will be paid back with an agreement to be paid back to help these guys survive mm -hmm. the time off. Yeah. But and I think it's a fantastic idea. And, you know, it's been tough floating it past Naira. But the purse cushion belongs to the horsemen and women in New York. And it's a, it is a good idea. And when they get back on their feet and racing starts, we give them a very low interest payment plan to pay that money back. And it's going to go into the purse cushion. Purse cushion has always been there. It's been there for 20, 30 years. There is always a positive number in that purse cushion and i think a lot of people are really hurting because no horseman is gonna not let the horses be taken care of right. so people are losing money every single day and it's been well over a month now and it's going into the second month and if you really look forward i mean i don't think there's anybody out there that really projects seeing racing again before at least another 30 days, maybe May 15th, maybe the end of May, whatever it is, these people are going to need help. Horses are expensive. Just the upkeep is expensive and it's very tough on the trainers right now. Absolutely. And even, even beyond that, if we think about like the struggling from, from not just the trainers, you know, globally, the, the global struggle. And I know the question that a lot of is weighing on a lot of people's minds, you know, um, since you were a New York based trainer, I know you went to Florida in the winter, et cetera, et cetera. But um, what are, what are, what is going to happen, you know, if Saratoga race meet does not go off this summer, a lot of people are wondering the impact on the um, small locality that is Saratoga Springs, because we're talking that is the money making time of the year for Naira for um, for all the small businesses. So I, I just am curious on your take because you're from you're from Long Island originally, correct, but live here near Saratoga. I live in Hoosick Falls. Mm -hmm. And that's where I am today. Right, right. Getting ready for four to six inches of snow in the middle of April tonight. I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I have to have some wine to fix that yeah. for sure. So I don't know if, you, if you've um, had any thought processes about um, or heard anything about, you know, Saratoga potentially being run at Belmont or potentially running without spectators. There's all kinds of rumors swirling around. I'd just like to get your thoughts on that. Well, I think that Naira has to make Saratoga happen. You know, the, the lucky part is we're talking July 16th. Mm -hmm. So we have two months to almost three months for this thing to blow over so we can have Saratoga. And if you, you know, I'm no scientist. Nobody, I don't, I don't know anybody. There are, even the scientists seem confused to me. <laughs> and I'm Everybody's no scientist, confused. but I think Naira has already delayed the Belmont meet and they're talking about no spectators and whatnot. But I think that the curve looks like Saratoga can happen, but nobody knows who knows. I don't know what's going to happen, but I think Naira has got to do everything they can to make it happen. N Saratoga is not about the betting. Saratoga is about the people. The, on a on a huge scale, yes, it's about the betting, and that's how racing floats and stays, keeps its head above water. But Saratoga is an experience, and it's an experience second to none for families, children, people, the greatest fans in the world. We have to try and make Saratoga happen, and the effect, the 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 coattail effect of Saratoga 
is the restaurants and everything upstate New York and the people and the tourists and everything that's happening. I think Saratoga will happen. I think this thing will be behind us, but if it's not, it's going to be a very difficult situation. But you know what? It's kind of like being at war. We're at war with this virus right now, and this is going to be things that you and I and everybody else talks to their grandkids about. You know, back in the year 2020, you can't believe what we went through. We went through this. We never thought we'd go through this. When I, when this first happened, I was thinking people are going to riot and loot. And I was thinking I need to buy a gun. I don't, I don't own a gun. I was thinking I need to own a gun because this is going to be crazy. But America has really come together and really held their head high and attacked this thing and accepted what they had to do. and and made the changes so that we're certainly we're certainly starting to make a dent in this thing so mm -hmm. saratoga i think has to happen but you know what lots of things haven't happened look at our triple crown mm -hmm. how smart was churchill churchill grabbed the labor day weekend they went to the the furthest that they could where they still would have that Kentucky Derby appeal. The people would still be there and everything else. And they said, we're taking Labor Day weekend. And sadly, so far, I mean, I would think that, look, we all have to make sacrifices. I know it's a kick in the teeth for Naira and it's a kick in the teeth for Laurel and Pimlico. But I would have been, within minutes, I would have said, okay, this is 2020. This is what we're going to have to do. We need to preserve the sanctity of the Triple Crown. And even though it's, they're both lousy weekends, two weeks after the Derby, we're going to have the Preakness in Maryland. And three weeks after that, it would be, you know, um, I believe it would be September 5th, then uh, September 19th, and then October 3rd, if they wanted to have the normal progression of the Triple Crown. And I would, I would have already made that announcement if I was Naira. I would have said, yes, we're going we're gonna to preserve the sanctity of the Triple Crown. The Triple Crown is the Triple Crown. Uh, Churchill, you know, might have gone, kind of screwed us by doing what they did. But the Triple Crown is the Triple Crown. We're still going to have it. And then work back from the Triple Crown and start rescheduling the Traverse so that it's a positive for the Triple Crown, reschedule the other three-year-old stakes that would normally be the Haskell and the July and August stakes and try and make it all work. But mm -hmm. instead, everybody's up in the air right now and I, I don't know what's going to happen. But you sure get the feeling that Naira is concentrating, and this is rightly so, on making sure Saratoga happens. Then we'll worry about, see, see if we can get a few weeks of Belmont before Saratoga happens. But nobody knows. I mean, this yeah. is a terrible thing. And uh, it's just something that we have to deal with. And we're all figuring it out as we go along. The trainers, the horsemen, the owners, the, the powers that be, they're all figuring, all figuring it out as it goes along. But there's so many question marks right now. I would, I, you know, I think they need to clear them up one at a time. Start with the triple crown. We've already got the first leg. Don't ruin it. Don't don't make it a Belmont and then a Preakness whenever and then end up with the no. Just fall into place and let's have our triple crown and let's continue and let's just make 2020 the year that was mm -hmm. or the year that wasn't. But you know, there's nobody in this business or in in the entire world right now that hasn't had to make changes in order to survive. And we're all on, in this together. Exactly. And I mean, I, I, I think it would be a phenomenal, phenomenal thing if they could still make the Triple Crown happen for later this year and just move some things around. And uh, your comments about Churchill taking what was necessary to make sure that they could still have their money nugget for the year. Totally spot on there. Um, it will be interesting to see how it all unfolds and how uh, the tracks reschedule, but for 
an industry that is so deeply rooted in this is how it was and this is always how it's always been to have the rug pulled out from underneath of them without any adaptability just goes to show you that they need people with different thoughts and minds getting in behind the scenes in management for example in marketing and how the industry needs to change to become more adaptable for what we're experiencing now in humanity with your low attention spans and the the marketing that most tracks do is blasphemous in my opinion it's just nothing near what any other industry does to make sure that there's fans so right. this is just a, a another eye opener for the tracks themselves that they need to if you don't what what bob dylan say um Change is like the only constant. That's like the only thing. And this industry hasn't changed for how many hundreds of years? And it's time to do something different. It's your apps. Anna, you are so, so right. And in 2012, I was this close to being director of racing in New York. And that was something that I, in my heart I really wanted. And I was working with Charlie Haywood then. And Charlie's a great man. I know he got a bad rap over what happened. But it was a mistake. They made a mistake. He paid the price. He lost his job. But had Charlie stayed, I would have been made director of racing. And we talked. Uh, I only bring Charlie into this because he was the guy whose ear I had. And he was the head of Naira at the time. We mm -hmm. talked about how to make racing accept the fact that they're a sports venue. Racing is a sports venue. Baseball is a, is a sports venue. When I go to the baseball game, yes, I love the game, but it's all the other stuff that's happening that makes it worthwhile, that makes us leave there after the game and say, we want to go back there. We want to go back there. Racing has never embraced that. In certain tracks, some people have. You know, I, this year, for the first year, I sent 10 horses to Tampa. And I looked at what Mrs. Thayer does down there, and they get it. Mm -hmm. They have affordable food for the people. They, have, they put on shows. They do things for the people. They make it like a country fair. You mm -hmm. go to Gulfstream. They get people there. They have a way of attracting people there. They've incorporated racing into all those high, beautiful stores and restaurants and everything else. As I was leaving after the last race one day at Gulfstream, I was in Christine Lee's restaurant. I'm leaving, and it's 6 o'clock at night, and the last race had just run. And I'm walking out of the restaurant, and there's a line of 30 or 40 people waiting online to come in. Not for the racing, but for the restaurant because it's a sports venue and that's mm -hmm. what people do. They come there for the night, they come there to eat dinner. You know, racing has to embrace that. And Charlie and I used to talk about racing needs to take some cues from Disney because mm -hmm. they don't, they pay minimum wage, yet people go there and it's the greatest experience on earth. The guy who's sweeping the street talks to you. The, guy, the security guards talk to you. The characters talk to you, everybody talks to you, and they make it a place where you want to go and a place where you want to come back to. And racing has to do that. And let's, let's take the perfect example, Saratoga. Mm -hmm. Saratoga is so busy. There is so much happening that you can bring a five-year-old, and that five-year-old is not sitting there all day saying, Mommy, I want to go home. That five-year-old is having a blast. And there's things for them to do. The parents can gamble. There's something happening at every single turn in Saratoga. It's busy, busy. And the, one of the things I like doing the most at Saratoga is an hour or so after the races, I ride my bicycle. I ride through the grandstand and everything. You go over to the Shake Shack, there's 200 people there partying still. And the races have been over for an hour, two hours. They're having a good time. You don't see that at Belmont. You don't see that at Aqueduct. Racing has to accept the fact that they are a sports venue and they are there to put on a show and make it a place where people want to go. And, and that's been my speech and it's always fallen on deaf ears. And I think um, I 100% I agree. 
And for those that may watch this that are Saratoga locals that have only been to horse racing at Saratoga, we have got it good in Saratoga. What great racing, world-class racing that we have here. If you go to a lot of the other tracks in the country, it is not the same. They, they do not treat it the same. And even Saratoga can work on some of the marketing and things that they do um, to generate new fans and to continue to keep the interest of the younger generations, for sure. So yeah. go ahead, Gary. I've always said that you really have to touch, that reach out to that demographic that surrounds the racetrack and find out what makes those people tick. If they're not at the racetrack, find out where they are and let's bring those things to the racetrack and make it enjoyable. Uh, I'll never forget, you know, I'm a Jets fan and I'm a Mets fan, so I love pain and punishment. You know, it's, <laughs> it's so, usually so little to be happy about when you're a Mets and Jets fan. You know, you have a couple of good years now and then. And one year, the Jets made it to the playoffs, and we're at Aqueduct. And I'm thinking to myself, why isn't this place draped in green? Why isn't there a huge party for the Jets fans? Why don't we bring in, you know, old Jet players to sign autographs? Why don't we auction off some footballs? It's very little investment, but we need to have the party at our house because that's our team. That's a New York team but nothing. You go to the races on that day and there's one or two TVs showing the, showing the game, but you're in the heartland of jet territory and nothing. You know, I think racing really needs to embrace the entire situation, the entire demographic surrounding it and get those people to come to the races, whatever it takes, mm -hmm. whatever it takes. If, if, if the industry wants to continue to survive. Um, one of the things that you talked about in several videos that I've watched is um, talking about doing a racing, um, having a racing commissioner. And instead of having all the states making all their little separate rules about all the different stuff, and then you're shipping and then people get, um, there's bad publicity for racing because if you run on um, a certain um, pharmaceutical that's allowable in Florida and then you ship to New York and it's not allowed keeping track of all that nitty-gritty and having one nationwide set of rules can you speak a little bit to that because it drives me nuts and I'm not it, even in the business anymore it drives us all nuts <laughs> it, I don't know what people know about this but so far today if you're a trainer and you're getting ready to run a horse in Philadelphia or you're getting ready to run a horse in Louisiana or California wherever you are the first thing you have to do as a trainer is call up and find out their rules on certain medications because there's no uniformity whatsoever, none. And what happens is mistakes are made. A lot of medications are oral, a lot of med, and look at the people that we have giving oral medications. You know, people make mistakes on that end. There's obviously penalties for all of this, but what happens is since there's no uniformity in this business, you have some very bad drugs that are okay to run on at a certain area, and you have some very good drugs in that same area that are not allowed, and you have to be almost a pharmacist to figure out what you're doing. And I've been a proponent of having a racing commissioner because we need to lie under the same blanket. We need to have the same rules. We need to have the same penalties, everything. Perfect example, Alex Rodriguez. He was the highest profile baseball player with the highest contract in the entire world. He came up positive from, for a performing, performing enhancing drug, PED, and he got his half a year to three quarters of a year uh, suspension. Mm -hmm. The same thing, because there's a baseball commissioner, is going to happen to a guy in AAA in Peoria, Illinois, that gets that same PED positive. He's going to get the same penalty that Alex Rodriguez gets. But in horse racing, you have guys, and I, I, I could use Tom Amos as, a, as an example, but it's happened to a lot of us mm -hmm. where a, a guy gets a positive for, say, methocarbamol, which is Robaxin, mm -hmm. in Louisiana. It's a six-month suspension. You're out of work for six months. 
You lose your horses, you lose your owners, you lose everything for six months. That same suspension in New York would be one week and a thousand dollar fine. If that if that's the case, we need it to be the same everywhere. We need to be judging trainers with complete transparency where the guy in Louisiana gets the same penalty as the trainer in New York. The problem is right now, and, and I understand the problem, and you're going to understand the problem as I say this, the stewards, the stewards in New York are guys that I grew up with. I was galloping horses when I was in my 20s with guys that are now stewards in New York. So if I'm the leading trainer in New York and I come up with a positive, my friends are judging me, guys that I grew up with. And they're trying to keep me in the game because they're trying to help me and they're trying to help me get through this. And, and we have a personal relationship. And the guy in, in Louisiana, who knows who he's being judged by? And the bottom line is if we had a commissioner, everything would be transparent. Everything would be equal. This is what it is. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. Instead of having all these cockamamie rules that nobody knows what can be used at what track, at what time, what the withdrawal dates are, nothing. Perfect. Another perfect example, justify. Mm -hmm. Justify. We saw what happened with Bob Baffert after he won the Triple Crown. Mm -hmm. he, there, was a, there was a positive that that horse had before the Triple Crown. And who knows how it would have been judged? Who knows what would have happened? But the person who made the judgment call for no penalty on Baffert, and that was probably the right call, was an owner of Baffert's. The head of the California Racing Board owned horses that Baffert trained. You can't do that. You can't be judged by people that you work for. You mm -hmm. can't do that. Uh, my thought was, if you have a racing commission, I'm not looking to take the day-to-day -day duties away from the stewards in New York. They find the guys who speed in the, in the, you know, in the track, a guy who comes up positive and, uh, on a bad pee test for marijuana or cocaine or whatever. They have their job to do. But the stuff that affects the outcome of a race should go to a racing commission that has set rules for those drugs and for that situation, and it's already been proven. It doesn't matter if you're Billy Mott, Bob Baffert, Gary Contessa, or a guy you never heard of. If it's the same drug and the same group and the same amount, you're going to do the same penalty all for you. There's no, there's no, well, we need this guy here. We can't give him six months or we need that guy here. We can't give him four weeks right now. There's no, there's an Take appeal. Take the politics spot. out. All right. the po politics. And, and you have your right to present your case, just like the legal system in the United States. But if you take the high profile stuff, the stuff that comes out of races, post-race positives, the stuff that comes out of races, the big stuff, a guy that gets caught with syringes, a guy that gets caught giving his horse something with a needle, which is totally unacceptable. If that stuff goes to the commission, they're going to be judged fairly and transparently. And I've been a big proponent of that for many years. And it's very hard to get anybody to listen because nobody wants to give up any power that they may have in that position. But everybody, every sports venue, it goes back to sports venues. Every sports venue has a commissioner. It's a commissioner of soccer. There's a commissioner of football, baseball, hockey. I'm a big hockey fan. You go to a game and the commissioner's there, everybody boos them. Mm -hmm. everybody boos because you can't be well liked if you're the commissioner because you're the guy making the rules mm -hmm. somebody's going to say if you're a commissioner you're always going to have a line right down the middle people that think you made a great decision and people that think you made a lousy decision so you're never going to appeal to everybody but at least you're making a fair decision mm -hmm. and whatever decision you make is going to be the industry standard when it happens again right Right. And hopefully in, in adding to some of that uniform, uh, 
uniform behavior, uniform punishment, et cetera, it can help to kind of clean up some of the stuff that's been going on in racing, which we won't get into today because I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to dive down that road of all the, the doping s s uh, scenarios and stuff that have happened just because we could talk for another four hours on that, I'm sure. Um, but hopefully having someone there that is making uniform decisions based on this that actually can make punishments be the same across the states you can't if you are six months suspended in louisiana then you you it's the same everywhere do you know right. what i mean so hopefully yeah. that can eliminate some of those um situations and be better for the horses and gary just so the fans that are watching um know can you explain what methocarbamol is because it sounds like it's this horrible thing for horses but once you tell people what it is then i think that will help them Okay, methocarbamol, most of the drugs that trainers come up positive for are therapeutic. Let's mm -hmm. face it, every trainer is a coach, mm -hmm. and his horses are his team. And when I talk to people about my horses, I say, I'm like the coach of the Giants. Mm -hmm. but, and what I have is I have my team, and I have my injured list, and I have my possibles and mm -hmm. probables, and I have my questionables every single week and what happens is let's just take a football player and compare him to a horse a football player can come to you and say coach my elbow is killing me mm -hmm. a horse cannot tell you that mm -hmm. and horses have a tremendous amount of endorphins and most of the time just their everyday normalcy they block the pain that they're feeling it's mm -hmm. very subtle horses pain so we have so we have horses that need therapeutic drugs this is an athlete that weighs 1200 pounds methocarbamol is a muscle relaxant a horse gets a charlie horse they just they get charlie horses just like people do we call it tying up people call it a charlie horse you're sleeping in the middle of the night and you and your your muscles go like this you take a muscle relaxer if it's bad enough if you have to um so horses if we feel we'll look at a horse or we'll bring in an acupuncture so we'll bring in the veterinarian and he'll go over the horse and they get tight hamstrings they get tight back muscles they get tight shoulder muscles and you got to give them a muscle relaxant sometimes you have to give them an anti-inflammatory like butazolidin or banamine those are those are anti-inflammatories with a half-life of about 20 minutes. So, I mean, you give a horse a shot of Banamine, the half-life is 20 minutes. It stays in their body for 24 hours, but it, it cuts in half every 20 minutes. The half-life of these drugs are just therapeutic drugs to make them feel better, make them get over the little problem they have. We alter their training a little bit, we tweak it a little bit, maybe give them a couple of days off, but it, most of this is therapeutic drugs. Mm -hmm. The big the big scandal that we're going through right now was non-therapeutic drugs, and that's out there too. And if you have a racing commission, you can do the investigating into these things. The FBI, they, they say it right up front. If you read all the paperwork with the recent scandals, they stumbled into this. They were investigating A, and then from phone taps, they discovered what was happening in the horse business, but they stumbled over it and it became a big deal. But we all know when somebody is not playing fair. Oh, Everybody right. knows it. I know it. Most of the powers that be know it. But if you have somebody that, even if you think that person is not paying, playing fair, but you're a racetrack and, you're, and that person is running eight or nine horses a day with you, you can't, you, you know, it's it's normal human nature to maybe look the other way just a little bit because if you call that person out you're also losing a big chunk of your day-to-day -day, uh, horse participation so th that's another thing where i believe a racing commission could have eyes on what's going on everywhere without putting the individual tracks in a position where they have to police themselves. It's a very difficult thing. And the tracks aren't set up for that. Our tracks are not set up. Our stewards are set up for making decisions when things happen. But we do not 
really police ourselves anywhere near what should be in our industry. There is not, there, we do not have the police. We do not have the undercover units. It's all straightforward. And I believe we could do a much better job of policing ourselves. Absolutely. I definitely agree with you on that front. Um, so I heard through the grapevine, mostly because I've, I've watched some of your social media posts, that you may be writing a book. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's about or not yet? Well, yeah, yeah, of course I can. Um, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm putting together my ideas. I've always called the racetrack the other side of the fence. Like I do a lot of charity work. And a lot of people call me to be like an MC at the, at, you know, Special Olympics or whatever. And I usually start my rhetoric by saying, you know, there's a fence around the racetrack. And I've often wondered whether they're trying to keep us in or trying to keep the outside people out. And I often think that they're trying to keep the people on the other side of the fence in. And so I'm thinking about writing a book called The Other Side of the Fence. And it's going to be the experience. I grew up on Long Island. My mother scrubbed bathrooms and drove a school bus. And my father was a very bad alcoholic, uh, but he was a uh, mailman. Okay. And how I got into the horse business, I'll never know. But basically, I'm not going to tell the story of what it was like being a kid on Long Island. But the day I walked into the racetrack, it was the strangest experience. And it's been an unbelievable ride for the last 40 years of what it's really like on the other side of the fence. I have seen it all. And some of it is really good. Some of it I'm not real proud of. But most of it is beautiful. It, can, it could be a Disney movie because it starts off sweet, it gets ugly in the middle, and then it ends really good. You know, <laughs> typical, that's the typical Disney movie. And, um, but I, I would like to bring my experience of being a guy who should have never been able to be leading trainer in New York. When I grew up, when I was growing up, I'm watching the Triple Crown on TV, and it's all about Laz Barrera, Mac Miller, Scotty Schulhofer, all these legends. And I'm like, Mom, I want to be a horse trainer. My father would be like, shut up, man. You're, you're going to be a mailman. I'm going to get you in the post office. Like, no, no, no. I want to be a horse trainer. I want to bring the experience of, I mean, the first day I walked onto the racetrack at Aqueduct for Dave Sazer. I left the bank, I quit my job, gave him time, and went there. I was 18 years old. The guy hands me a horse and curses me out because of the way I walked him. I had never walked a thoroughbred before. I walked standard breads. Standard breads, you could tie them to a, the office door and they never move. Right. I, all of a sudden, I, I'm walking my first horse and it wanted to kill me. And it was just a roller coaster ride all the way to New York, to leading trainer, to winning 17 training titles to, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think I have a really good story inside of me to tell. And I think it would be funny. It would be heartwarming. And there'd be some parts that would be tragic, but I think it would make a really, really good book. That's awesome. I would definitely read it. Definitely read it. I would love to at some point. I mean, unless it's funny we talk about, um, you know, when we were talking about marketing and how tracks need to do something different, we've kind of had some discourse on this before about if people have not been involved in the industry, they really have no idea what really goes on behind the scenes, good, bad, and otherwise. So I wanted to end our chat today um, with, you know, maybe one thing that you wish that the general public knew about racing that is really not um, very, very public or um, that people are not aware of, right? Horse racing is always getting this heat. They're always, you know, you know, animal, blah, 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 right? All this. So what's one thing that you think the general public needs to know about racing that they don't? I think, and I've done this. I know you've watched my videos. Every year I opened up my barn to barn tours and brought people, normal people, to my barn every single day 
for blonde tours. And every Tuesday I do clinics uh, just to bring the outside people in to the racetrack and give them an up close and personal with what we do every single day. And one thing that is universal, none of them realize how wonderfully the horses are taken care of and how much they are loved. We, we need to show that to people. I, you know, we do things, you know, we have like the tram ride and they ride past the barns. Gary Contessa wants to have that tram ride loaded with people and stop at my barn mm -hmm. and let, let's talk. Let me answer your questions. Let me talk. The one thing that I want people to know is I want people to be educated about our business. People think, and what happened this year gives us a black eye, but people think that we don't care. And I think you know, because you've been there and I've been there my whole life. When something happens to a horse, it's the same as when something happens to one of our children, my children. We, we spend, we're up all night with them. We, 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 I mean, we work our whole world around our horses and people don't understand that. The naysayers say, they, they say BS to that. They say, that's not true. I would open up. I would, I would like to see Naira and every racing jurisdiction give the fans that hands-on opportunity. And they don't need to come and make a nuisance of themselves, but we can find a way to teach people what it's like on the backside of racing and how much we love what we do and how fortunate we are to be able to do what we do. And I think that would, that would you'd see the change in people and, and if people realized that we're not in it for the dollar. In any business, there are doctors that cheat the system. There are lawyers that cheat the system. There are stockbrokers that cheat the system. So there's always somebody that cheats. And those are the ones that people see. But we, we are in a business where 99.9% .9 of the people love what they do, and they would gladly step in front of a car for their horses, because mm -hmm. that's the way they are. And that's the way it's always been. That's exactly what I would have picked to share with the general public too. Is these horses are loved by their grooms, their hot walkers, their trainers, all of the people, their exercise riders. Like they, they, you know, there's ones you don't like as well, but you're always looking out for the best interest of the horse um, on that front. So that's, that's awesome, Gary. Um, the education piece is so extremely important. Um, we don't live in a time, we don't live in a world where people grew up on farms where people grew up where, you know, I'm from Indiana, Podunkville, Indiana. Sorry, all my Indiana folks watching this. But even I didn't grow up on a farm where, you know, you work with animals and people understand that sometimes animals need um, um, care or how, how things go when you work with a farm. People just don't understand that. We live in a different time now. So if we can educate how, um, how the track is run, how horses are trained, I think that would be an incredible thing for, to help the general public. And everything we do today in racing is mm -hmm. for the benefit of the horse and rider. We have come full tilt. We have come full tilt from when I first started in 1975 to today. I mean, there are so many, so many safety things in place. Now, if we could just make the experience for the fan better, it would be, it would be remarkable. But our safety is second to none. We're really doing a good job on the safety front. That's awesome. Any last thoughts you'd like to share with everybody, Gary? Well, my, la my, only, my last thought is, and I know that this podcast is up here in upstate New York, and I just want to say the fans up here, I have never in my life met a better group of fans than I, than I have up here, upstate New York. I love the people. I pray that we can have a Saratoga meet with people. And uh, we're all in this together. Don't forget, if we don't, we're still going to talk about it. Five years from now, when this is all behind us, we're going to talk about it and hopefully laugh.
right? Can't wait. Can't wait to be on the other side of that. Well, thank you guys very much. Gary Contessa um, and Anna Smith coming at you today. So if you have any questions, this is going to be shared on YouTube and on Facebook. Feel free to ping me and um, we'll get your questions answered. Bye, everybody. No problem. If you want to put my email address out there and people can ask me anything they wanted to ask me today. Perfect. I'll okay. definitely, we'll definitely do that. And Gary, have a great day. It was so awesome talking with you. We may have to do another update, one of these, um, when I can awesome. get everything uh, going so that we don't have any tech issues. Gotta love technology. So. Let's do it. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Bye. Bye.